Welcome to Mountain View Church. I am so glad that you're here. Uh, my hope is to uh, prepare your hearts this morning so that they won't be disappointed when the SEC runs all over USC tonight. So, sorry, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I want your heart to be in the right place so that you're not disappointed by loss. I, I wouldn't know because Tennessee's not going to lose any games this season. So, uh, Hubble uh, Telescope and the scientists working with the Hubble recently discovered a brand new star that they didn't know existed that is 28 billion light years away. Just for some category, just for some context, uh, they, they thought that the furthest star was 9 billion light years away, which is impressive, which is huge, which is massive, but now they've discovered a brand new star that is 50 to 500 times brighter than the sun that lights our earth and even millions and millions of times hotter uh, than the sun here in our galaxy. Why does any of this matter? Because somebody needs to hear this morning that God is bigger and greater and grander than anything else going on in our life. And I don't say that just to over-spiritualize anything this morning. Because I don't want to just throw some spiritual sayings your way so that you walk out encouraged and, and on fire. I want you to have something to hold on to when life gets tough. Because oftentimes when life goes sideways, oftentimes when life gets hard, we hold on to the hard instead of those great truths that God is bigger than what's going on in our life that God is greater than whatever season that we're walking through. I know in my own life, when, when things go sideways, when I get all wrapped around the axle, I'm so quick to internalize what's hard about my life, what's wrong about my life, what's difficult about my circumstances. And somebody needs to just be reminded this morning, and maybe it's just me, but somebody needs to hear this morning that God is greater than whatever's going on in your life. That what has happened to you, what has hurt you, what trauma has shaped more in your life and in your, in your circumstances than you wish to admit, is something that God can be trusted with. Because he's not overwhelmed, he's not burdened, he's not, he's not sidetracked by the the hurt and the harm and the, the heartache in our life. And oftentimes we, we hold on to, to seasons. We, we hold on to circumstances that, that, that have been overwhelming. We, uh, we get uh, wrapped around the axle. We start to go sideways with, with things that have happened to us. And this morning, God has an invitation for us to experience and and. and and hit this new stride that, that he's inviting us to in, in forgiveness. That I'm telling you what will absolutely change your life. I'm not saying it's going to change the circumstances of your life. I'm not ch saying it's just going to make everything rosy and peachy and just fine. I'm, I am saying, though, that, that God uses forgiveness in our life, not just to shape our eternal life, but to shape our life here and now. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We're in this series, Walking verse by verse, kind of slow walking our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and we've come to this most famous prayer in the most famous message ever preached by Jesus himself, with several hundred, if not thousands of settlers on this hillside in the region of Galilee. Jesus offers this model prayer, not just as a phrase and not just as a saying for us to grab onto, but something for our life to gravitate toward. And Jesus says this, and we're going to kind of jump into the middle of this passage in verse 7. And when you pray, Jesus says, so there's already this assumption that we are praying. Not just in, uh, not just in throwing out spiritual things, not just in saying certain religious things that become a rhythm of our life, but when we enter into relationship through prayer, through communion with God in prayer, when we pray, Jesus says, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, 
for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Jesus is opening this whole idea about when we pray by saying, don't do what these guys do. Now, when Jesus is saying this prayer, when he's preaching this sermon, there are people around who, as soon as they hear Jesus say, don't pray with this religious babble like the pagans do, their mind would have been instantly triggered. Their mind would have, have been uh, triggered to think through how pagans pray. We don't have categories for that. For us, we're like, well, why would, why would pagans pray? What are, they, what are they praying about? What are they, who are they praying to? I was just in Africa a couple of weeks ago in literally the country of the birthplace of voodoo where there are people in villages, in every village, who pray to their python god. Let me tell you, if there's snakes in this building, we're going to burn it to the ground. All right? It, it, I, I, can, I can give you chapter and verse for it, but literally people show up in their village to this python temple to pray to an entire room full of pythons. And they offer their worship and their, their sacrifice to these pythons. They even self-mutilate and cut their face and their foreheads and their necks so that they look like the God that they worship. That'll preach. And so as Jesus opens this uh, this encouragement around prayer. He starts by saying, when you pray, don't babble on and on and on like the pagans. This is how uh, some pagan prayers of the first century would go. The ancient Egyptian prayer to the pagan god Akhmun Ra went like this. Hail to thee, Akhmun Ra, Lord of the thrones of the earth, the oldest of existent, ancient supporter of all things, chief of the gods, lord of truth, father of the gods, maker of men and beasts and herbs. Apparently, this is the god of cilantro. Maker of all things above and below, lord of wisdom, lord of mercy, and most loving opener of every eye. This is just the opener of the prayer to the pagan god Achmun Ra. How do you know when you've said enough names? How does one know when you've gotten this particular God's attention? Then you've got the Akkadian prayer in the first century to the moon God that goes like this, Father Nana, Lord and Shar, hero of the gods. Father Nana, new hero of the gods. Father Nana, seen hero of the gods. Earth, hero of the gods. Father Nana, Lord of the shining crowns, hero of the gods. Father Nana, who is grandly perfected in kingship, hero of the gods. Father Nana, who solemnly advances in princely garments, hero of the gods, ferocious bull, whose horns are thick, whose legs are perfected. Is this Father Nana just sitting around saying, please get to the thick horn part. I love that part. How do we know when we've gotten the God's attention? This is the standard way of addressing the God. This is the babble that Jesus is referring to. You may remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 18, this great showdown between the God of heaven and earth and the God of Baal, this pagan God. And there was this great showdown between one prophet of God, Elijah, and 450 prophets of Baal. And these prophets of Baal start early in the morning. They've got their sunrise service cooking early. And from very early in the morning until noon for Five, six hours, they start crying out to their God, Baal, but nothing happens. There's not a word. There's not a sound. There's nothing at all from their pagan God, Baal. So what do you do if you can't get your God's attention? Well, in the story in 1 Kings chapter 8, when Baal wasn't responding, when Baal wasn't showing up the way that they were hoping and expecting, they just started dancing. And then when dancing didn't Work. They started shouting louder as if their God spoke a foreign language like we do when someone doesn't understand us. We just start to shout louder. Maybe that'll help. When dancing and when shouting didn't help in 1 Kings 18, they started to physically harm themselves and slash themselves with, with swords. How do you get the God's attention? Physically harm yourself, apparently. When that didn't work, they just started frantically prophesying and offering everything they could of value, you can start to see why Jesus says, when you pray, 
Don't pray like the pagans just babbling on and on and going on and on with all of these empty phrases that are not helpful. They're just harmful. Emotionally, spiritually, relationally, physically harmful. But their attitude, their posture in this moment wasn't just to mutilate themselves. It was rather, how can we get the God's attention? Are the gods angry with us? Maybe you've wondered that before. Maybe you've wondered, is, is God really listening to me? When I pray, when I enter into this spiritual conversation with the God of heaven and earth, does he listen to me? Can he hear me? And if he does hear me, does he even care about what's going on in my life? And if he does care if, about what's going on in my life, can he do anything about it? Maybe it's something that you've wondered. Because if we're being honest, nowadays aren't a whole lot different from those days. This mindset, this posture, this worldview, this understanding of is somewhere, someone ticked to the point that we've got to shout, that we've got to dance, that we've got to physically harm ourselves just to get God's attention when we pray. And so Jesus, as he opens this, when you pray, releases his children from having to make this special effort to guarantee some special access to God. So who is this God that Jesus is inviting us to pray to? Who is this heavenly father who Jesus is showing us? Well, Jesus goes on, when you, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Verse eight, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. Jesus refers to the heavenly father, the creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of life and everything that we know as our father and goes on in verse nine, pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus opens the prayer by saying, our father, daddy in heaven, you know everything and you are everything that I need. Jesus shows us by saying to us, hey, this one true God, his posture toward you is love and pleasure. This God wants to commune with you. And so when you pray, pray like this, dad in heaven, you're everything that I need. This was revolutionary, totally groundbreaking to approach the creator of heaven and earth with this. But God says it's simple. Because of Jesus, you can now come to me. I'm your father. I love you. So when you pray, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then Jesus takes a break from the prayer, finishes the prayer that deliver us from evil, and then says this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Remember, Jesus has couched this entire prayer, this entire conversation under this umbrella of knowing that God already knows what we need before we even ask it. And so what is it that we need? We need forgiveness. More than anything else, we need to be forgiven by God. I remember as a child, uh, I was you know, like five or six, so just a couple of years ago, um, our family moved into a brand new house. It was the very first time we'd lived in a new home in our entire life. Uh, new carpet, new walls, new ceilings, new fixtures, new lights, new wallpaper back in that day. Everything was brand new, and my brother and I had our own space. We each had our own room, but we also had what we call in the South a bonus room, kind of a playroom, this separate area where all of our video game stuff was out, all of our toys, everything was stored in that one area. So I'll never forget the day that we moved in. We were unpacking everything uh, that, that morning, and so I'm pulling out my G.I. Joes and my Hot Wheels, and my brother's pulling out his Barbies, and we're getting everything taking it, I'm just joking, he doesn't play with Bart, but getting everything out, and I, I remember seeing at the bottom of a box this strip of paint. Have you seen this? Like, I think Crayola still makes it. Uh, Rose Art makes it in not as good of a fashion, but 
I pull out this strip of paint, and it's all the different colors, all of the eight colors of the rainbow on one strip, and they're all attached. And so as a four- or five-year-old little boy, I get the idea, hey, this would be a great object to throw at my brother. And so before really thinking through it, which is kind of how most guys operate, before really thinking through it, I just decided to throw it at my brother. And as soon as I threw it, the entire world went in slow motion. Because in slow motion, each of the lids of those paints started to come off. And all over our brand new house, there was paint all over the ceiling, all over the wall, all over the new carpet, all over my brother. And it just went end over end over end until all of the paint was all over my house. And immediately in that moment, I just fell to my knees and started weeping. I knew I was busted. I knew I am in so much trouble. My mom and dad came running into the room, probably thinking that one of us had killed the other. But they found me just crying in a pool of my own tears. And I'll never forget that my dad scooped me up in that moment. And he took me up in his arms and he said, son, it's okay. I love you. I know you've made a mess, but there's nothing that you could ever do. There's nothing that you could ever say that'll change the fact that I love you. Now, I realize that my experience with my dad may be different than your experience with yours. Uh, I have the blessing of a father who responded that way. Maybe, Maybe you don't. Maybe you've been in a situation like that, and instead, you received wrath, and you received anger. And so when we open a prayer like this with Jesus saying, start by praying our Father, your mind automatically goes to your relationship with your earthly father. But as we said last week when we opened uh, this series on uh, the Lord's Prayer, we can't have our view of our earthly father as the beginning point of our relationship with our heavenly father. Because it's just going to muddle up our theology And our understanding of God was never meant to be shaped by our earthly experiences alone, but by Scripture alone. God's not abstract. God's not different for each and every one of us based on our own personal experience. And so what Jesus is doing as he starts with our Father is he's anchoring this conversation, this prayer, this relationship in something very concrete and tangible. Because our Father responds to our mess so different with exactly what we need. Jesus says this, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus often used stories to explain truths in practical ways. And Jesus kind of drills down into this story of forgiveness and why forgiveness ought to be the pattern of our life In the story of Matthew chapter 18, he's telling the story of a master, a king, who has a slave show up in his office one day, a slave who's owed him millions of dollars. The slave comes in begging for mercy, crying out for for help. Would you just forgive my debt? And so the king decides to forgive the debt. He lets this person go, and as soon as he lets this person go, This person goes out into the community, leaves the palace, and goes to the very first person that he could find who owes him money and demands in that moment, pay me what you owe me. This guy who was just forgiven, this guy who was just released from the debt that he owed, now runs and demands the debt be paid to him. Word gets back to the king, to the master, and as the master's hearing about this, I can just imagine that there's some disbelief in his mind. What are, you, what are you talking about? I just forgave him of millions and now he's going and demanding a couple hundred bucks from this guy. I, I don't believe it. It doesn't make sense. Look at the debt that I forgave you. I made it as if you never owed a penny. Jesus, as he's talking about forgiveness here, says something incredibly controversial in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Did you know that the only part in this prayer where Jesus offers commentary, where he offers some further explanation, is when he talks about forgiveness. 
Jesus offers this explanation. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus says that forgiveness is the pinnacle, not just of the gospel of grace, but of the Christian ethic that we carry. Now, Jesus isn't equating forgiveness and forgiving others with salvation. He's not saying you have to forgive others in order to be saved and forgiven by Jesus. What he is saying is that there's a spiritual privilege to forgiveness, a social responsibility of forgiveness. Now, to further unpack forgiveness, we've got to talk about snorkeling. A a snorkel helps you to breathe when you're underwater. It helps you to get air from above the surface of the water when you're swimming underneath the surface of the water. But a snorkel also helps you give air and breathe out. A snorkel is this movement of air from the same tube that allows you to stay underwater and still live. Forgiveness is a similar concept. It's the love of God that flows to you in your life that forgives you of what you've broken in your life. The same tube, though, allows the love of God to flow from you to others. But when we fail to forgive, when we just want to receive forgiveness, it's like we're taking duct tape and wrapping it around the end of that tube. It's like we're shutting off and blocking off that flow of forgiveness to and from. But we attempt this spiritual snorkeling all the time, don't we? We go to God wanting and begging and hoping for grace and mercy, and then we go out to others and demanding justice. But we do that with the excuse of, well, Brandon, they really hurt me. What they did to me was really wrong. What they, what they said really hurt. My story's different, Brandon. You don't know what I'm going through. And there are so many ideas and so many understandings of what forgiveness is. A lot of times we misunderstand forgiveness and think that forgiveness is weakness. We think that forgiveness is surrender. We think that if we forgive someone that we just become a doormat to that someone. How will anyone learn from their mistakes if all we do is forgive them every time they make a mistake? Listen, I'm not saying that forgiving is forgetting. I'm not saying that when you forgive, you're acting like it never happened. I'm not saying that forgiveness is just apologizing. Someone says, sorry, okay, great, forgive them. I'm not saying that forgiveness requires and demands a partnership. No, there are times where you can forgive and still, hello, still have boundaries that it doesn't happen again. Forgiveness doesn't mean we forfeit justice. It just means we don't operate in a credit and debit system. It's not, you hurt me, so now I'm going to hurt you. But here's what else forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not optional. You may think, well, well, Jesus forgives. That's great. That's nice. Uh, That's because he's Jesus. I'm not Jesus, so this is hard for me. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm just saying it's not optional. Because of what Jesus says here, we don't have an out when it comes to forgiveness. Because as followers of Jesus, we've got to redefine and be reshaped by his life and his teaching. Because Jesus didn't just come to raise the spiritual standard. Jesus came to change the system. And so, true forgiveness is this. True forgiveness is my release, my letting something go, letting a season go. Letting this moment of hurt and pain and trauma and abuse, just letting that go. True forgiveness is my release and God's removal. There are certain things you cannot expunge from the record of your life. There are certain things that you just can't can't just move beyond easily, but God can, in his grace and in his kindness and in his mercy, God can move and remove. Now, please hear me loud and clear. I'm not saying that you earn your salvation by forgiving other people. What I am saying is the forgiven forgive. Not so that we can be forgiven, but because we are forgiven. Because of our debt, because of our sin and our brokenness, Scripture says that we are aliens, we are completely other from God, but yet God in his mercy 
chose to forgive us and cancel our debt. Those who have been forgiven of much ought to forgive much. And what we find out that when we forgive is that forgiveness is like setting a prisoner free, then discovering that the prisoner was me. Unforgiveness is like eating rat poison, expecting the other person who's hurt you to die. True forgiveness is my release and God's removal. Forgiveness is releasing what no longer serves you and reclaiming control over your heart and your mind and your body. Forgiveness is choosing to let go of the burdens that others have placed on you, to set them down so that you can move forward lighter and unburdened. Forgiveness is freedom. Now, I know it's hard. We, we talk about forgiveness a lot in church, but it's, it's hard to know, where do I even start? How do I even take a first step? What does this look like practically in my life? So let me unpack and let me walk you through uh, in this next hour the strategy for forgiveness, okay? Strategy, a framework, uh, a foundation for where do we begin with forgiveness. Uh, number one, when it comes to forgiveness, we've got to name the pain. You cannot heal what you cannot name. Some of us just need to start by saying, hey, that hurt. Hey, that was wrong. Hey, that was abusive. Hey, hey, I went through some real trauma through that. Some of us need to start by getting very specific. This is what hurt. This is what was painful. This is what was wrong and abusive. You can't heal what you can't name. And so some of us need to get really specific with that. Go to the moment, go to the hour, go to the room, go to the person, go to the conversation so that you can name that pain. Don't just say, hey, that was painful. You gotta move to step two. Step two is this, process the pain. We gotta start to process and bring others in. Safe people, people who you can trust, people who you can have a conversation with to say, this hurt, I just need to process this with you. Because the reality is unprocessed grief in me, it doesn't just disappear. It always comes out somewhere sideways, somewhere else. If, if we don't actually deal with the, 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 the processing part of this, it's just going to continue to come up and come out. A lot of times we need to heal out loud so that we won't die in silence. And pain that doesn't get transformed often gets transmitted. So we got to name the pain. Let's get specific about it. Let's process it. Uh, process it in community with a friend, with a therapist, with someone who's safe. But then, number three, grieve the pain. This, this grieving process must happen for us to get to the place where we can start to forgive if we don't deal with the grieving process, it's usually going to harm me. It's going to harm those around me, my family, my kids, uh, our community. Because unprocessed grief doesn't just go away. It usually comes out sideways. But then number four, remember God's forgiveness. Remember that you have been forgiven of so much. Listen, you could build a mountain of sin and guilt and shame and, and brokenness. You could build a mountain as high as Mount Everest and God would come in and say, hey, that's great. I've got a taller, bigger, greater mountain of grace. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter five. As he's writing to these churches, navigating uh, what life looks like in Christ, he says this, now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased and sin has increased in my life, like it probably has in yours, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. See, I think the extent to which we are unforgiving to others, sometimes, not always, the extent to which we're unforgiving to others shows the extent to which we don't understand the forgiveness shown to us. So we gotta remember God's forgiveness in our life. But then there comes a time where we have to release the pain. A couple of years ago, I experienced some of the deepest pain and church hurt that anyone could imagine. If I told you some of the stories of the trauma 
that I went through as, as a pastor, my family went through, some of the bullying that our kids went through just because their daddy was pastor. You would have honest questions of, Brandon, why do you still want to be in ministry today? And it wasn't just a hard season for us. We can do hard things. We do hard things. This was a season of spirit, doing life with spiritually unhealthy and abusive people. And so I've spent the last couple of years processing some of this trauma and hurt with my therapist and my soul care coach and uh, working through some of the wounding at the hands of church people. But if I'm being honest, this hurt, this pain, stuck to my life like Velcro. I'd come to the place of, uh, of trauma and, and hurt and abuse where I was just hanging on to it. But if I wanted to take steps forward, if I wanted to begin to get healthy, I had to get to the place of releasing the pain. Forgiveness, again, is my release, but then my part is over at that point. Because then for true forgiveness is God's removal. Uh, which means I don't, have to, I don't have to follow up on anything. Hey, did you get my text? Hey, did you get my email? Did you get that letter that I sent? I, I don't have to follow through on that thing. Hey, what do you think about the forgiveness that I offered you? Hey, what did you think about what I said? No, true forgiveness is my release. I just let it go and trust that God can remove. And then next, after we remember God's forgiveness, after we release the pain, next is we just keep forgiving. Can I just let you in on a little secret. I know this is not the way to sell Cutco knives, but when it comes to forgiveness, there are just moments where you have to just keep forgiving. Forgiving someone else for something else at some other time. Forgiveness is not a one and done process. It's a, it's a lifelong process until Jesus comes back. But then finally, in forgiveness, we gotta pray for the one who wronged you. There is a spiritual posture that God works in our heart in ways when we pray that it is almost impossible to be mad at someone while you're praying for them. It is impossible to want someone to get hit by a greyhound when you're praying for them. I know in moments it's tempting to just want the worst for someone. To want the worst for someone who's hurt you and led you through trauma. But when it comes to this strategy and this framework for forgiveness, Jesus invites us to continue to pray for that person. Listen, prayer and this whole idea that Jesus is giving us, prayer is not about changing God. Prayer is about changing us. Prayer helps us to engage in the presence of God when it feels like God is galaxies and galaxies away. Listen, everybody look at me. I am walking through this real time, right now. And I can tell you personally how hard it is to forgive after feeling so hurt because they hurt you. What they did to you, what they said to you, what you experienced because of their recklessness, it was wrong. Many times it's not your fault. You, you've been hurt. Can I just say, I believe you. I hear you. What's been done to you was terrible. It should have never happened. It was awful. And if no other person says this to you, can I just say to you this morning, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that that happened. I'm sorry that you had to walk through that. I'm sorry that you had to experience that. I'm so sorry. Maybe you've been waiting all this time for the person who hurt you, to acknowledge how bad they hurt you. Maybe you've been waiting around hoping that they would say those words, I'm sorry, to you. To repent, to promise that they'll never do it again to you. But if you continue to wait for that person to say that they're sorry before you can forgive or before you can move forward, then you're allowing that person to hurt you over and over again. That's a choice they may never make to say sorry. But forgiveness doesn't diminish the offense. It just stops the offense from poisoning your heart. And Jesus knew that unforgiveness leads to bitterness. 
and bitterness leads to wreckage in our life. Forgiveness, then, we've got to realize and recognize that forgiveness is something for you, not just something from you. Reconciliation, that takes two people. Forgiveness, that takes one. That takes you. And so today, my question for you is, who do you need to forgive? What have you been holding on to? Or have you been wondering if God can actually bring healing to your heart? Maybe there's somebody today that you need to forgive. You've been holding on to that moment. You've been holding on to that pain. You've been holding on to that trauma, that season. And it could be very real hurt, but today you can experience very real freedom. Maybe, maybe the person that hurt you doesn't even know that they've done that to you. Maybe they're living their best life, not even realizing they've wrecked yours. Today's your day of freedom. Today's your day of breakthrough. Listen, this is not going to be easy. Please don't hear what I've said today as a prescription for some easy out. It is not. It won't be easy. But can I just tell you, you're not going to be alone in this process. You're not going to have to walk through this forgiveness on your own. This morning, uh, we're going to have folks on the wings that would love to pray for you would love to put their arm around you and remind you that you're not alone, that you don't have to figure this out on your own, that you're not walking through forgiveness on your own. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to be with you. We'd love to chat with you. But whoever you need to forgive, would you do that today? Maybe, maybe for you, the hardest person to forgive is yourself because you know what you've walked through. You know where you've been. You know the shame. You know the embarrassment. Can I just tell you today that God loves you? Not the ideal, not the sanitized you. He loves you right where you're at. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we're grateful. <clears throat> we're grateful for your forgiveness. We're grateful for this pile and pile of grace that you pour out on us. God, we're grateful that in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our shame, you still choose to love and forgive us. And so God, as, as people who've been forgiven, may we become a people who forgive. Not so that we can earn your love or your affection, but so that we can show everyone your love and your affection through the way that we live a life that's been shaped by you. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.